I couldn't help thinking this morning, as I was preparing this sermon of an old song, how apt it is. This old house is getting shaky. This old house is getting old. This old house has seen the rain. This old house has seen the cold. This old house once rang with laughter. This old house heard many shouts. Now it trembles in the darkness when the lightning walks about. Ain't going to need this house no longer. Ain't going to need this house no more. Ain't got time to fix the shingles, which we never did get around to doing. (laughs) Ain't got time to fix the floor. Ain't got time to oil the hinges nor to mend no window pane. Ain't going to need this house no longer. It's getting ready to meet the saints. And so, for those of you who are out there listening to this sermon on cassette or on CD later, you won't get it on cassette anymore, I don't think. This, this church, the Tyler Church of God, sold this property some time ago, used the funds to build a new church building, which is not quite finished yet, but the contract calls for us to be out of here this week. So, out of here we will be, since we don't want to come and meet on the rubble next week. I don't know what they're going to do with this place, but it wouldn't surprise me to see it torn down. Certainly, it would be at the least moved away, because the people who bought this property have much more in mind for it than what this house would be. You know, we never know from one day to the next what God has in store for us, nor what God will make of it, nor where He will take us. I've been in the ministry now approaching 50 years, and I, and I could never in, have ever in my lifetime have imagined the path that I would take to get to where I am today. It was God's doing, God's choosing, His direction, and here we are. But years ago, when we were looking for a place to meet, we looked to buy the little church that lived just south of this building, right behind me where I stand. It would have suited us well enough. We kind of liked it. But for whatever reason, that deal fell through. I think maybe somebody bought it before we got it was what happened. But memory served us. So we looked at this house next door, which was also for sale. I think it was maybe the parsonage or something that went with that church at the time. And as it happened... This house had a much larger, rather larger garage than most houses its size did have. And it was just, and then just behind the uh, garage was the family room to the house. And so we were able to take that wall out, and you can see basically where it was, and created this, this room that you have been sitting in all these years, uh, listening to me and others preach on the Sabbath day. What really served, though, out of this building, which has served us quite well, was the location. I don't mean location for our convenience. I mean location for the value of the property. Because it has this property increased in value by more than 300% in the time that we have been here. None of us could ever have foreseen that. Now we can leave this place. We can move to a better building, better suited to growth, more room for everybody. And there have been times when we have been downright crowded in this room. Uh, on holy days or special occasions. We thought we did the right thing when we bought this place because we knew where it was, but no matter what we thought, God had thoughts that went way beyond what it was going to do for us. We had no idea how right it was. So now we are moving, and I suppose this building will be torn down or moved away to make room for whatever it is that the new buyers are going to be doing with it. The road outside is being widened and expanded. In fact, Tyler is just moving in to this area. Now, we think we know what we are doing with this move, but it's only a matter of time before God lays another challenge before us, and we have no more idea what that one will be than we did what the last one will be. And we will have to decide how we're going to respond to that challenge when it comes. Now, How we respond when the challenge comes determines what kind of a church we are going to be. And I think it's important for us, maybe on this day, at a time we're getting ready to make a move, and for those who are wise enough and old enough to understand, realizing it's only one move of many that we'll make in the course of time, we'll have to think about what it means for us and what it will mean for us. Remember John the old apostle who was in exile on the Isle of Patmos because of the gospel and because of his work, he wrote a letter from that place that echoed down through history. It's been variously understood, variously applied, variously misapplied. 
but it's been vital to the church in all ages. It's the book of Revelation. And it's awfully easy for us to forget that the book of Revelation is an epistle. It comes on the heel. It's of 21 of Paul's epistles, 7 of the general epistles, and then bang, here comes Revelation. One more epistle to the churches. Thus it begins, John 1 and verse 4. John to the seven churches in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and was and is to come, and for the seven spirits before his throne. Now, we need to tread very carefully at this point. I heard someone once on a forum opine that the seven spirits before God's throne means that there are seven holy spirits, which is a, an overly literalistic approach to interpreting scriptures. I don't think that's what it means at all. I want to lay a little foundation for understanding prophecy in general and revelation in particular, and it's going to be useful to us as we make our way through this particular study today and considering how it might apply to us as a church. Now, you may hear teachers speak of type and anti-type in the Bible. The words come from the Greek. And in the Greek, the word type is actually referring to the die, the little image at the end of, a, of something where you put it onto metal, strike it with a hammer, and put that image into whatever it is you're driving it into. It might be any, a, a piece of metal. It might be a clay tablet. But it's, it's, that's what a type is. If you can hearken back to the old days of handset type, you'll be getting very close to knowing what it's all about. Because type, coming from the Greek as it did, meaning what it did, is what's applied to those little things that people, little blocks that people used to put in and put them in place and lock them in place, and they put a piece of paper on it, roll it, put ink on it, and roll the paper over it. And the anti-type was the image that was produced off of the type that was on the page. We move so far away from that today with printers and all the stuff we do nowadays that uh, it's all easy to lose track of the origins of a word and where it came from. Type is a die used to strike an image. Antitype is the image struck by the type. Now, so many people and events in the Bible are types of something that is to come later. Isaiah, on occasion, said, I and my children... Our signs are for signs in Israel. The Hebrew word signs corresponds to types. Basically, he meant we are here as images, models, types of something that is to come off in the future. Now, there's another useful metaphor in studying these things in, in Revelation. It's in, 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 the, in the computer age, it's becoming very familiar to us again. Uh, it comes from the Greek. It goes a long way back in Greek usage. It's the word icon. And all of us now who work on our computers are familiar with it. We realize that we don't have to write out a whole list of instructions in a computer. Used to, but don't have to anymore. If you want to print out a document. When you get through typing your little document up, you look up at the upper part of the screen, you see a little tiny icon that looks like a small printer. If you click on that icon, it sets in chain what I guess is called a macro that puts together all the instructions necessary, far more than you would imagine, for your computer to move what you've got on your screen to the printer and onto a piece of paper as it comes out the other side. The icon was very much in use in Greek. The Greeks all understood what the word meant. They just didn't have you know, the use of it like we do. Now, when we understand that icons stand for something bigger, more complex, and more involved that can be explained in a few words, we're getting close to the usage of icons in the Bible. In the Bible, there are living icons as Isaiah and his sons were said to be. There are verbal icons. That is, there are verbal descriptions of things seen that mean something beyond what is seen. And for the people who originally, I think, I have the idea that for the people who originally read the works that we're talking about, they were a lot closer to understanding these things than we are today. Because for an icon to be of any value, it needs to be intuitive. It needs to be suggestive of whatever it is that it's going to do. As, for example, a, very, you know, a little tiny printer in the top of your screen, or a little letter T, and then a letter TT, both of which mean something relative to the type font you're going to use and the size of type you're going to use. You learn these. I may be giving a revelation to some of you people about your computer you didn't even know. And this is also important. There are also numeric icons. And this is very important when we come to this particular thing. There is, for example, the number seven. 
there is the number 144,000. And for some strange reason, well, not, I can understand it really, but some people absolutely persist in seeing numbers in the Bible in this way as literal. Now, sometimes numbers are literal. Sometimes they are not literal. They are icons. And it's up to, you, to us to understand what the number means, other than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Because we now understand, I think it's been understood for who knows how long, that the, word, the number seven is, a, is an icon for complete, for whole, for all that there is. This is it, the whole thing. And so when we see seven spirits, we're basically talking about a representation of the whole of the spiritual realm that is before God. Now, this makes interpreting prophecy a tricky business because we are so far removed from the icons and the intuitive meaning of the icons that we've got to do a little work before we can even get back to them. Now, in turn, it means we should treat prophecy with a great deal of respect and with humility. So what do we make of the seven spirits before God's throne? Seven is a numeric icon. It stands for the whole. In Texas, it means the whole shooting match. I mean, all that there is. There is no need to interpret what John says here. Just realize seven is a symbolic number, not literal. Grace be unto you in peace from him which is and was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What does all that mean? Well, really, it means what it says, not much more, certainly not any less. Uh, it does reach out, frankly, further than you and I are quite able to deal with. We know some of it. We wonder about things in here, and you could probably have time to have a good Bible study and discuss that for an hour, the things that are in these few verses. But he goes on to say, Behold, he comes with clouds. Every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. Wow, that when you when you get this, when you hear who, you know who's talking, it's Jesus Christ already been identified as to who it is, who was, is, and is to come, is really an expression of saying he he is eternal. He has he is transcends time and circumstances. I expect by the time John when, when John finally was sitting down writing these words up as to what he had been and seen, every hair on his head was standing up, still from trying to grapple with what it was. And so he said, I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Do you notice something? You notice how this first and the last, first and the last, you know, Alpha and Omega, all this is keeps being repeated again and again. He says, I want you to, whatever you see here, write it in a book and send it to the seven churches in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, you could, of course, insist that seven is literal, because here are the churches they are all named for us, which is a pretty good indication they might be. Seven means seven. There they are. And yet, when you know contextually where you are in the Bible, something in the back of your mind ought to cause you to question, is there more here than just a literal interpretation? Is this more than a first century letter sent to seven churches along a mail route in Asia Minor? Or is there something else going on in here? What might that be? Well, we have numeric types. Seven is a type of everything. We have churches who may serve as human types. They also are types of something. If indeed we are speaking that way, what are they types of? I think the seven churches are living icons. Of what? Why seven? I take it they are types of the whole church, 
And the broad context suggests to me that they are typical of the whole church down through time. And what I am suggesting, and this is a very, it's kind of an unfortunate uh, analogy to draw of, of a great sausage here. And no matter where you cut it, no matter what angle you cut it at, no matter how you slice it, is one of the sayings in our vocabulary, you still wind up with a cross-section of the whole church, linear, to, to, you know, contemporaneously, you name it, it's there because it is all that there is. And frankly, when you look at the, these, these letters in context, reading them, see what they say and what they mean, you're kind of left with the impression it has to basically mean the whole church at any given point in time. And since we are sitting in a given point in time, we might very well find ourselves somewhere in all of this. Now, the old idea of the church being successive eras of time is so loaded with problems, it just re you cannot make that, that particular description work. I won't go down that road today. I have done it before. I don't know if we still have any of that on tape or not. But anyway, I've done it. I uh, don't really want to go there now. But I have fully demonstrated to myself that church eras, seven successive church eras, doesn't work. Now, Demonstrating all this, as I said, would take us down a different road, and I don't want to go there. Number 12, verse 12. I turned around to see the one that spoke to me, and I turned and I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Anybody have any real question mark about who this is? His hair and his hairs, head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a two. And his countenance was like the sun that shines in its full strength. Now, I defy you, if you have any artistic ability, to sit down with your oils and canvas and paint this picture. Because it is, a, it is not something that can adequately be represented in an image, because it's an icon. It is a verbal icon. He doesn't literally have a sword coming out of his mouth. It's symbolic, and it is symbolic of things we learn later about this one, that he will, in righteousness, judge and make war. And that's what the sword, as an icon, means in the Bible. It signifies war. Now, I think we all understand that this is a symbolic re representation of the glorified Christ. It's asinine, as I said, to try to reproduce this as art. It's a verbal icon, and everything about it is symbolic, probably all the way down to the expression of brass. Now, when I saw him, he said, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. He is the one who can open the grave and release everyone from the, from the control of death. Then he says, write the things you have seen, the things that are, and the things that are coming hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, I pause to emphasize that the Greek word angelos, which we just transliterate as angels, means messenger. And we'd be better served if when they translated the Bibles, they leave that word angel out of it. It carries way too much baggage in our generation. Okay? But anyway, to the angel of the church, uh, the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks you saw are the seven churches. Okay. So... The lampstands represent all the churches. Seven, all the churches, anywhere, all the time. Then, of course, the stars are the angels of all the churches. Now, if you're thinking about this, it should make you sit up a little straighter, because this church, too, has an angel. Don't know much about him. All I know is what I read in the book, and that apparently any church... Any group of people who gather together to serve God in the way that we have actually has an angel. And we have already seen that our angel is a real estate genius. 
it remains to be seen what he will do with us. Now, I want you to remember something that God said to Israel when they left Mount Sinai. It's in Exodus 23, verse 20. God said, Behold, I send an angel, that is a messenger, before you, to keep you in the way, to bring you into the place that I have prepared. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. If you shall obey his voice and do everything I speak, then I'll be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. In other words, I'll be on your side. I don't care what's going on. But you had better take heed to the leadership that I've given you. Now, we don't see this angel. Uh, unlike the old song, This Old House, I don't really see an angel peeking in the window pane. But nevertheless, I have a certain confidence that that angel is with us, has been with us. Probably is here every time we have church. I don't know where else he has to go because this is his job. To watch over, to see at to us. Now, he won't make up our mind for us. You know, he won't keep us from doing stupid things if we absolutely insist on doing stupid things. But it's not as though we don't have enough information to know what kind of people we ought to be, the kind of things we ought to be doing. I mean, it's all in the book. We shouldn't have to struggle very much with that. But I'm just so struck by the fact that God says, if you just will be responsive to my leadership, and you should, you know, the angel is somebody we don't fall down and worship, we just know that somebody's looking af after us, then we really, if we'll really keep our nose to the grindstone, and we'll really keep ourselves, our shoulder to the wheel, we will be able to be in a position where God is an adversary to our adversaries, an enemy to our enemies, and a friend to our friends, and a friend to us. So, there are seven real churches, each with an angel, each with a messenger, and each of these real seven churches is symbolic, or that is the total of the seven, are symbolic of the church in any and all ages. Revelation 2 comes the first letter. Under the messenger of the church of Ephesus write. Now, I've always been fascinated by this because what he said, that the letter is seemingly not addressed to the church, but to the messenger of the church, to the angel of the church. This one that we don't see, but nevertheless is with us and working with us. So the letter is addressed to him, but it's also directed to anybody that has ears. Take a look at the person sitting next to you. See any ears? I mean, they're, they're probably there. So it's addressed to anyone who has ears. And as you read along, you're just left with the inescapable impression that this is talking to everybody in the church, whatever church it might be. So what about this church? Well, these things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your work. I know your labor. I know your patience. And I know how you can't stand those who are evil. And you have even tried those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. Oh, they had told them there'd be plenty of false, apostles, false apostles, false prophets, false teachers. And they tell them, don't let yourself get sucked in by that stuff. And he says, I commend you. You have tested people like this, and you have found they aren't what they claim to be. Now, you have also borne and had patience, and for my name's sake have labored, and you haven't fainted. What does that mean? It means you haven't given up. You just keep on keeping on. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. And I've often thought about that because I can go back and hearken to way back when I first began to learn about the things that I now believe in terms of the law of God, the holy days, the Sabbath, and began to grasp what it was that God had me to understand. I was on fire with it. I really was. I was excited. I wanted to tell everybody. I wanted to convince everybody. I wanted to take the whole world in with it. But over time, over time, you begin to lose that. And in a sense, I think all of us experience the loss of first love. Now, I don't want to, I am going to say, I do believe that it's not possible to maintain the level of intensity that we had when we first came into the truth. It would be unreasonable to think that anyone really would do that. At the same time, it is not unreasonable to, to expect us to maintain a drive for God and a drive for his work and a desire 
the desire that keeps us moving forward. You've left your first love. Now remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, and repent and do the first works, the works that you were doing. If you don't do it, I will come to you quickly and will remove your candlestick out of your, its place, except you repent. Now that, that is sobering to me. I, you, you sort of think, well, God's church is forever. Well, it is. Uh, that God's church will never fade away. It won't. But that doesn't mean that any given church will last forever. It doesn't mean that any given church will survive. That, in fact, the church that was in Corinth, that in fact, every one of these seven churches to whom these letters went are gone. They were gone not that many years following the time that this was written. Now, the people went elsewhere. Other Christians were raised up in other locations. The church didn't die out. Obviously, here we are. But the point simply is this. We have no individual guarantee as a church that we will continue forever. It depends on what we do, how we do, how we treat one another, how faithful we are to God's Word. We do not have a blank check from God. And he said, be careful. You have sent my angel to, to lead you on the way. Obey him. Stick with him. Now he says, but this you have. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I have also hate. Now I've heard a lot of very strained interpretation of who these Nicolaitans are. What we know about them is really limited to what we read in this one chapter of the Bible, which is the only place they're ever mentioned. Some early church commentators, though, suggest that the sect of the Nicolaitans was characterized by sexual promiscuity and immorality. And that comes as no surprise. It's not in the least out of historical context because this was one of the key things in the Jerusalem conference that's mentioned in Acts 15 that they were concerned about among the churches out there. They said, we really are concerned that you would abstain from fornication and from things sacrificed to idols. They had this list of four things that they were concerned about because they were so rife. And he does say that this particular church really did hate and despised and stayed away from the kind of doctrines that would lead them into sexual promiscuity. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, this is the theme. This He that has an ear that hears, to hear, let him hear. And he that overcomes. It will be repeated seven times through all these letters that we find here. To overcome means that there is something to be overcome, a battle to be fought, a struggle to win. And it's from this, from this series of expressions, To Him That Overcometh, that I borrowed the title, Born to Win, to express the fact that we were put here to win, not to get rolled over. We are here to overcome. Win is one syllable, overcome is three. So it works better for a slogan, as it were. So, since we all have ears, what can we take away from this letter? That would be of value to us as we move now into a new home. One, we are evaluated on our work, our labor, our patience. I mean, it's looked at. There's a log kept. There's a, there's a roster kept. There are accounts kept as to how we do perform. We are expected to evaluate people who make claims of leadership. You know, don't just swallow what people say. Listen carefully, but then, you know, test them. Third, we must not grow faint. We can't afford to be giving up. We may need to reevaluate some things we're doing, but we don't need to walk away from, from things. We need to realize that just because we get a little tired doesn't mean there isn't one more thing to be done. We also need to know that we will be chastised if we lose our first love. Just count on it. It will not be overlooked. And we are expected to oppose promiscuity in the church, and we live in an age where it is everywhere. And it has to be condemned, it has to be opposed, it must not be tolerated in the church. Now, I'm not saying from that if there was a couple that began to attend with us who were living together out of wedlock that we should forbid them to come here. But the point simply is this, that sometimes these things get out of hand. And as a church, you must, must realize that we have to stand for a certain level of conduct and there are certain types of conduct that we should not stand for. What's our reward? We get to eat of the tree of life. The one that had leaves that healed everything and with which you could live forever. Okay, verse 8. 
To, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, what can we learn from this one? These things saith the first and the last who was dead and is alive. I know your works, and <laughs> nothing escapes him. I know your works, your tribulation, your poverty, but boy, are you rich. I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of those things you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. In every generation, in every time, there have been brothers of ours who are poor, in tribulation, in poverty. We don't seem to be in that place here at all. But we, I think, need to remember that we have got brothers and sisters in this world who are precisely in this place. They are poor. They are hurting. They are in tribulation. This particular description doesn't fit us very well, but you've got to remember we're not the only church. There were seven. In other places and other times, our brothers have been imprisoned, sold into slavery, and killed. Our job, we need to keep faith with those people and identify with those people because they are us and we should never ever forget that he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death to the winner goes the spoils to the angel of the church at Pergamos write these things saith he that has the sharp sword with two edges oh now we're talking war I know your works I know where you live even where Satan's seat is you hold fast my name. You have not denied my faith. Even in those days when Antipas, my faithful martyr, was slain among you where Satan dwells. That's not us. Tyler is not Satan's seat. It's a pretty nice city. But there are brothers somewhere today who are living in this kind of shape and who have that kind of oppression upon them. Even though they look to Jesus Christ, even though they get on their knees and pray to God for deliverance, and even though they read the Bible as guide for their life. Antipas, a real person. He also is a living icon, now a dead icon, because he was martyred. But it's happening every day, somewhere around the world. I have a few things against you, because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now, what was it about the doctrine of Balaam that he objected to, particularly in what he's mentioning? It is that they would eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. So you have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, same thing, promiscuity, which thing I hate. Now, you may think that our society is saturated in sex. You may think that you can't go, do, go anywhere or do anything that without running into it at every place you go. And it is certainly true that it is a dominant feature of our society. But we are nowhere near where Corinth was in this regard. Nowhere near where some of these places that, God, that these churches were, were, were living were regarding sexual immorality. To the extent that the apostles had to write to these people and tell them, don't eat meat offered to idols and don't commit fornication. Why? Well, because it was a common practice as a part of their religion that they were coming out of. And they had to be told explicitly about these things. There were a lot more things they would learn. They would learn them when they went to synagogue to hear the Bible read. But these were the things they had to look out for. And I, it, it's, it's really been more in recent years that I have come to, to understand the depths of the depravity that these people had come to. I didn't really understand what, a, what the meaning of temple prostitution was when I first heard of it. It's nothing like a woman who decides, well, I, I really believe in my God. I'll go down and, and be a temple. No. They were sold into that as little children, little boys and little girls. And they were slaves in those temple to their prostitution. It was everywhere in the empire at that time. I got this against you, that you do that. I hate those things, God says. And there are churches who bear the name for whom promiscuity and fornication are acceptable behavior. Because we're not supposed to judge one another. And so it's tolerated. It, it comes to the place, not to put too fine a point on it, to where a major, significant denomination 
ordains a practicing homosexual as a bishop in it, in it and does not require the practice to cease. Now, what do you think God would say if he's writing to the angel of that church? Well, anyway, this is happening. Now repent, he says, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna. I'll give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written, which nobody knows, save he who receives it. Hmm. I wonder what that might mean. Okay, to the angel of the church at Thyatira, write. These things says the Son of God, who has his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. There's brass again. I know your works, your love, your service, your patience, and your faith in your works, the last to be more than the first. Now, here's something we can take around along with us. We would want to be a church with works, with love, with service, with faith, and with patience, wouldn't we? These are things we would like for God to be able to say about us. We can walk out of here with that in our hand. And we want to be getting, remember he said, what you are now, the last, is better even than it was at the first. This is the kind of report card I would really like for us to have. I know you would too. So, that being the case, if that should be an objective of ours, then it's perfectly right for us to pray about it. It's right for us to think about it. It's right to try to find ways of doing a better job of it than we are doing. This is all well within our grasp to cope with. However, I have a few things against you. You permit that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. Here we go again. It was everywhere at this time. And it was something that the church, somehow or other, you know, it's, it's the old saying about if you want to boil a frog, you know, you put him in a cold pan of water and you heat it up very slowly until he doesn't realize it and he can't jump out. Are we like that frog in this society we're living in? Are we getting so used to what's going on around us that we no longer oppose it? That we no longer actively oppose it? We may not even we not, may not be agreeing with it, but we are, you know, living with it. I don't know the answer to this. All I'm doing at this point is saying we really need to ask ourselves how we're doing in relation to these things and pray about them. Okay, so far so good, but it's a passing interest, by the way, that this fornication, things offered to idol, were very points mentioned in that Acts 15 letter. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She didn't do it. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, if they don't repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and the hearts and I will give unto you, every one of you, according to your works. Now, here comes something else you can take away. But I say to you and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden. Just hold on to what you've got. This is a message to people who find themselves in a church in a place where they just are almost overwhelmed with the way things are going and there's not much they could do about it. What he says to you, he says, if you find yourself in such a situation, God does not expect quite so much of you. Hold on to what you have and don't give up. That's important. And one of the things we can do in this generation of ours today is we can give people support from afar that couldn't be done very well back then. You know, there's that passage that I just love that says, then, then they that loved the Lord spake often with one another. And a book of remembrance was written before God for these people who did this. He says, they will be mine in the day I make up my special jewels. That's us. We have, we have the, a chance that no church in history has had the chance to do in the way that we can, in the way that we can give support to one another. In a way, that's the very reason why I've established this weekend Bible study online is so that people can communicate with one another, so that we can all begin to have a commonality, a common study that we're going through, not just in this church, but across a wide variety of people. And I've had some really touching emails from people who don't have a church to go to at all. They're stuck off in the middle of nowhere, 
and it just means everything in the world to them to be able to sit down Friday night, the beginning of the Sabbath day, and turn that on and feel like they are a part of something bigger than themselves. By the way, we downloaded, what, 375 downloads last week for that one, which probably represents close to 700 people who actually sat down and listened to that program because more than one in a family are listening to it. So we're getting a, a very good response to it. It'll be interesting to see what happens this week. And if you didn't know about it, you better ask. He that overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter, they will be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I'll give him the morning star. Ooh. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, I hadn't thought about it exactly, but when he talks about giving us power over the nations, the expression he uses here suggests the possible necessity of using violence against people who are recalcitrant. And I wonder if we are quite able to do that, you know, if we really can bring ourselves to do it. Well, this is what we see that, that he is going to do. It's a big reward for a person who can overcome in this terrible environment. He's, and it is sad to say, but sometimes what we have to overcome is the church itself. Think about that. There are people right now who are in that circumstance. They're trying to overcome the situation they are in with their own church. So let's be careful that we aren't a church that our own brothers have to overcome. They have to be strong. They have to resist where we're taking them. Let's be sure that where we're taking them is where they ought to be going. How we respond to the challenges we face determines what kind of a church we are going to be. That's what we have to remember. Revelation 3. What can we learn from the church at Sardis? These things saith he that has the seven spirits of, the seven, of, of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name that you live, and you're dead. Now, what are you going to make of that? Obviously, in Sardis, there was a gang of people who got together every Sabbath. You know, they were there. It was a church. They met. He says, you've got the name that you live. You have a reputation that you're supposed to be a live church of God, but you're just dead. Graveyard, dead. Now, how do you, how do you recognize that in the people? And how do you rectify it in a church? Well, again and again, he says in here, I know your works. What are you doing? Are you reaching out? Are you helping others? Are you just taking care of yourself? Are you just going through the motions? This is basically the thing you have to watch out for. Be watchful. Strengthen what you've got left that are ready to die because I have not found your works per per perfect before God. Remember what you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent because if you do not watch, I will come on you as a thief and you shall not know at what hour I will come upon you. And it will be a whole lot worse than the IRS audit anybody ever went through. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. There you are. Another situation to where there are those who, even though the church around them is graveyard dead, they still live. And they're still faithful. And they still struggle. I take it from this that you can't use the church as an excuse for your failures. You have to chart your course for yourself, and you've got to stick to it come hell or high water. Because in the end, you are responsible. Every single one of you is responsible. And you can't point the finger somewhere else and escape responsibility. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot his name out of the book of life. I'll confess it before my Father is in heaven, even though he's been reared up in a church that is barely able to move. You know, there is a risk. This is one thing I think we can take away from this, too. There is a risk of having one's name blotted out of the book of life, just as there is a risk of a church having its candlestick removed, and it isn't set in concrete or written anywhere. It is written day by day by the way, as individuals and as a church, we conduct our affairs. We will be judged for them. This is not a game that we are playing. He that has an ear, let him hear 
what the Spirit says to the churches. To the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, and opens, uh, shuts, and no man opens, opens, and no man shuts. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, nobody can shut it. But you have a little strength, and you have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Now this is the church everyone wants to be. Everybody I've ever heard of who, you know, talk about church eras or whatever, we are the Philadelphia church, and you are. That's what the, you hear. It's the, in a way, it's what lies behind the idea of the seven successive church eras. You know, that we're getting right down toward the end time. And if I'm living in the time of Philadelphia, I don't have to concern myself with what my church is doing. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to, 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 to try them that dwell upon the earth. And, of course, this is what makes everybody want to be Philadelphian. Is that whenever the big hard times come, you will be protected from them. Maybe. That's all I can say to that. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then there's the good old Laodicean church. Verse 14. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. I know you are neither cold nor hot. Oh, I wish you were one or the other, but because you're, you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. I remember some years ago I gave a sermon somewhere else where I said, I think we've been spit out and we're drying on the sidewalk. This is the bad church nobody wants to be. And it may hold the greatest temptation of all for a church in the modern age. What might that be? Well, because you say, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. And you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about a church that had plenty of money. You know, he's talking about real wealth when he says, you say I am rich. But when he talks about what you're really like, he's not talking about reality. He's talking about the spiritual poverty. We live in the most prosperous era and the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. And can you believe the whining that goes on that we may face a recession? Good grief, folks. Do you know where we are? Do you know how we live? Do you know what percentage of us own our own homes? What percentage of the poor drive two cars? What percentage of them own their house and it's paid for? When you start seeing poverty statistics, you need to look behind them. This world is rich, disgustingly rich. It's unbelievable how wealthy we are. We are so wealthy. Our children have got more money than most of the people, the adults that live in other parts of the world. And it has been the worst thing that could have happened to our children. And I hearken back to the prophet who said, As they were increased, so they sinned against me. The most dangerous position for a Christian to be in is to really be prosperous, have everything working, have everything he needs, and life's just working like gangbusters. And the truth is, it's when things aren't working, that's when we turn to God. That's when we turn around. That's when we try to put our life right. And maybe there's a secret in there somewhere. Anyway, too much money, too much leisure time. That's where we are, and that is probably the greatest risk that we in this church face right now. That and the fact that God has handed us a wonderful piece of property, a very nice building with plenty of room that we can meet in, it's all been handed to us. Now he waits to see what we're going to do with it. Because he didn't give it to us because of us. He gave it to us because of what could be done with it. And he's going to hold us accountable. He's going to hold us accountable for every brick as to what's been done. I counsel you, he says to Laodicea, buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich, white raiment that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, 
and repent. That word zealous is fascinating. Get off your backside. Find something to do. Do it. Work. And whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Use the resources you've got. Get on down the road. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This isn't, I'm not way off from you. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and we'll have supper, and he'll have supper with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne. Whew. That is something. When he makes that promise, he makes it to Laodicea. And in a way, this poor bunch of people have got one of the greatest hurdles to overcome that any of them have. And that is the complacency that comes about from just being a little too well off. As I say, we've been mightily blessed as a church. It hasn't been given to us for our righteousness. We haven't earned it in any way. We are just stewards. And we will be judged for how we use what we have been given. Count on it. If we expect to be given any more, we'd better be good stewards. And finally, when I was preparing this, it doesn't relate tightly, but I, I came to a scripture in Ecclesiastes that sort of stuck in my mind. It's in chapter 3, verse 10. I have seen the burden that God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time, and he has set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We're always looking. We're always searching. We're always going out there because the truth is we know somehow we're not at home. We somehow sense that this move is not our last. We somehow sense that this house which we built with our own hands is not where we're going to end up. We don't know where God is taking us. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is a gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. God does it so men will revere him. Go thou and do likewise.